Okay, Tony, over to you. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Tony Marcolini. I'm joined here today by my co-host, Martin Mangello and John Hartman. And today we have two very special uh, guests joining us to chat. Uh, boxer turned actor, John Duddy, and the uh, the great director and writer, uh, Colin Broderick. So let's go. Welcome back, everybody. I'm very excited to be able to chat today with John Duddy and Colin Broderick. Um, they really they're here uh, more so to talk about their new movie, A Bend in the River. But we're going to sneak in some other questions first before we get to the main event, because I have uh, we all have a number of questions for the, the projects you've done leading up to today. Uh, John, I think I'm going to start with you only because I know you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, so for most people, I'm sure, recognize your name and your face for your, your years of boxing. Uh, when you were first transitioning into acting from the boxing uh, arena, you did a video with Bon Jovi for one of his songs. What was that like, recording that? It was hilarious. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I say uh, going from getting punched in a... Uh, in the ring in Madison Square Garden, they get punched in front of a camera. They bond Juvie with his whole band in the ring with you. <laughs> getting knocked out because I was looking at a girl. It was uh it was very cool. You know, uh it's amazing how I kinda came and went and we got to hang out with the band. My wife Gronya was there. She's actually in the video for a brief second too. And I got to meet a lot of cool people through that experience. Uh Fisher Stevens, he was the director and uh Bon Jovi and the whole John Bon Jovi and the whole band were there too. They, they even let me sit and eat uh, lunch and dinner with them. I wasn't sitting with the rest of the, the cast and the crew. They were very, very nice. And uh, I met uh, a lot of a lot of very cool, interesting people. And uh, it was just, it's always good to see the what goes on behind uh, the scenes and all when you're putting uh, these stories together. And there's a lot more to it than, than meets the eye, you know. So there was, there was actually four different videos made for it. From like so, there was the one story, and he cut it up into different chapters. So, unfortunately, it wasn't as, as successful a song as most of Bon Jovi's, but <laughs> at least I got on there one somewhere. Well, I'm confident it had nothing to do with you. Uh, but that must have been an interesting experience going from, uh, you know, being an athlete to being on the screen pretending to box. Yeah, there's an art day that in itself, so there is like choreograph fight scenes and things, and uh, there's little tweaks and stuff. Whenever you're actually physically doing it, it feels and looks preposterous. But then when you get to see it on camera, it's like, oh, it all makes sense, you know? So it's got its own uh, technique and rhythm to it as well. But no, it was very enjoyable. And whenever you've got a good dance partner, which is this, the guy along with you that isn't, oh, don't be hurting me, don't be doing that. No, it's like, no, we're acting. It's not a real fight. It's not going to be real. I'm not going to touch you. And if you do touch me by accident, I'm not going to touch you back. So don't worry about it. You know, I had the same experience on Hands of Stone when I was working with Edgar Ramirez. I was playing Cam Buchanan. He was playing oh, Roberto right. Duran. And the first thing with Sydney was, you can't hurt him. And I'm like, what? They're like, don't hurt him, you know, please don't hurt him. He's our lead guy. We can't, you know, God forbid I break his nose or something. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I, I know my job. I'm here as an actor. I, I'm acting. I'm, I don't feel like I'm still a fighter. Don't worry about it. And uh, everyone's great. Scared. So with that, and uh, Edgar was a, was a, was a, a, a 
pleasure to work with and uh, we had a lot of fun um, letting on to beat each other up in the ring. Well, you were trained. I mean, you wound up uh, playing, as you said, Ken Buchanan in uh, Hands of Stone, but you had actually met Robert De Niro before that. Didn't you train him for a boxing movie? Yeah, I uh, ended up working with him for about six weeks before he went. They shoot a grudge match with Sylvester Stallone. So we did, and uh, that was a that was a great experience. Just seeing how he, his whole demeanor and his speech and everything, the way that he changed, the closer he got to his shoot dates, you know. And that was all in Manhattan. And then whenever they were ready for him, the way he went, I think it was in New Orleans or somewhere where they were filming. But that, that was that was a great experience. Now he's a very very nice man. Was he a pretty good boxer? I know he trained for Raging Bull. I heard like he was one of the top ten boxers in the world. They were saying, but he yeah, he well, they say that about all actors, you know. <laughs> They're all great fighters. Uh, I can tell you now, no, because once they get hit, it's completely different. But we're all great. We're all great at throwing them. We can all great. They look like it, and uh, and uh, he had skills. I mean, that he, and he he brought up to me about hands of stone, and I'm sitting thinking, going. Or uh, or uh, sorry, raging bull, and I'm like going, that's wow. I was six when that came out, you know, and I didn't <laughs> want to bring it up. So, but uh, no, he could put the combinations together, and he, he told me a great story about how uh, Jake Lamada uh, loved him because he had a good left hook, just like Jake Lamada, and and he could throw a nice crisp punch left hook. So he did. So no, it was a, uh, it was just very very enjoyable. I grew up, my father-in-law met Jake LaMotta down in Spring Lake, New Jersey in the 80s. Said he was a real nice guy. Do you know, I, I, we, mm -hmm. I was out for a, a meal with him, uh, with a, a, an older acting friend of mine, Hope McKellany. It was Hope McKellany's mother's uh, 91st uh, birthday. And Holt wanted to have someone from around that year. She was a, a Julie Wilson was her name. She was a, a, a very well-known cabaret singer in around New York in the 50s and 60s. And uh, so Holt wanted to have someone from that time and era. And we were sitting at the, at dinner along with uh, uh, Jake LaMotta and uh, his uh, wife was there. And I know when we were doing the introductions and you know, I, I reached over, how you doing? I'm John, nice to meet you. And I, I give her a little you know, kiss in the cheek. It's like, and, and straight away puts the hand up and separates me and goes, what the hell do you think you're doing? And he was looking me straight in the eye. And he's, he's like 80 something at the time, 86. And I'm looking at him. And he lifts his hand up to me and he says, hey, Irish, I can still throw a good left hook, you know? I, I was like, and everyone starts laughing. And I'm like, he's not joking. He's completely serious. So I says, I'm very sorry, Mr. Lamada. Sorry about that there. And I sat down. And then he's like, oh, and who's this? I says, it's my wife, Gronya. And Gronya leans up. And he's like, hello, Gronya. And he's like, kissing her, giving her a kiss to the cheek and a hug. <laughs> He was a very interesting character, very, very nice man, so he was, but, uh, you know, it, Interesting it was just, a, it, was just a, it was an honour to meet such a legend, you know, and, and they have as many fights as he did, and still they live to that age, and have all his faculties about him, and since he, he wasn't punch drunk, and he took a lot of punishment in his fights, and he was still physically and mentally sharp, you know? Interestingly yes. enough, the first time that I went to see John, I'm not a sports person, so I didn't follow John's career, but I was living in New York, and obviously you couldn't be Irish and living in New York when John was at the top of his game uh, fighting Madison Square Garden nine times, uh, not to be excited by what was happening. So I went to the one and only... Uh, boxing uh, fight I, I've ever seen, and it was a a fight at uh, the Beacon. Uh, Beacon Theater. Oh yeah, Beacon Theater. And I'd finally gone. I was like, let me just see who this guy is. What is all this buzz about? And at that fight, I walked into the lobby afterwards, and Jake Lamada was there with a big cowboy hat on him. And I actually got to meet John Duddy and Jake Lamada in the same <laughs> in the same night, which was uh, and and then and then we didn't. It wasn't like we were in touch, and I showed up at an event uh, at the Irish Consul shortly after that. You had just retired from fighting, John, and John came through the door, and we just somehow wound up chatting, and we've been chatting since. Well, thank goodness, because creatively, uh, it certainly worked out. Before we get to the movie, I, ju I just would like to talk to you, Colin, for a minute. Um, your first book, 
uh, I think was an it was an, it's an amazing read for anyone who hasn't uh, picked it up yet, and it's it's an autobiography, uh, really. And I want to say that you, I mean, you just it's a warts and all story. I mean, what what was that like to have to? I mean, you, you don't hold anything back. You definitely tell uh, your experience in the early part of your life. What was that like to put that on paper? Well, I, I, I got sober in uh, 2006. So 2006, or, you know, mid-2006, mid I, uh, I was 39 years old. I was in uh, Times Square uh, begging for dollar bills for vodka and Coke. And uh, I was living in Hell's Kitchen. I weighed 115 pounds and I'd basically, you know, pushed anybody that cared about me uh, out, out of my life. I didn't have a job. I didn't have money. Uh, and I was taking, taken to an apartment, a, a house, a farmhouse upstate to dry out at that time uh, up to my, my buddy Tony Caffrey's house. They took me up to try and save my life, basically. And as I was sweating and uh, going through the DTs uh, and sobering, I grabbed a notebook and started writing. Uh, and I basically felt like I'm going to write myself out of this mess and write myself back into my life. And that became uh, my first book, Orangutan, which was... Uh, an account of 20 years of living in New York as a construction worker, trying to become a writer, but really uh, crashing and burning in every aspect of my life uh, until that point. And then Random House uh, bought the book and published it nationally or internationally, and that sort of changed my life. And as I as I stayed sober and got into therapy and, uh, and and then got into my past about growing up in Northern Ireland, Random House also bought my uh, second memoir. That's that. And uh, <clears throat> you asked me what was the experience like. The experience was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> living it certainly. I mean, living the, the, li the living of it. The living it was a, was actually a lot uh, less painful because I had. Uh, alcohol and drugs to numb the pain i had medication uh but as i was writing the books i had removed all self-medication so i actually had to deal with the discomfort and the, and the pain and the trauma that i was running from my whole life which was my childhood basically sure i mean it's a, it's it's poignant i mean it's so it's definitely worth the read so worth the read uh it just i, I thought to myself gee that couldn't have been easy to put on paper uh just to read not only to revisit it the way you know you did but uh, just to make an admission i mean everybody wants to somewhat sugarcoat i guess their own story uh, but you don't do that you don't sugarcoat it at all no it was, it was ugly actually when i did the first readings i had people say to me it's got to be an exaggeration. I said, I've actually toned it down. <laughs> Nobody would believe how ugly and crazy it really was. Uh, so, uh, but I feel like that's, that's alcoholism and mental illness. And I didn't want to sugarcoat it because I'd had such a firsthand experience of it and felt so grateful to be alive that I sort of wanted to start my journey by saying, you know, I just, have been through this and you can get sober, you can get health, he healthy, you can get uh, help with mental health. And uh, I wanted to make, you know, that's been a big part of my own uh, journey for the last 14 years being sober. I've never tried to hide behind a sugar coated version of my past because I feel like it's important for me to say, Hey, I was a drunk and a drug addict, but, you know, I'm also a, a dad and a husband now and a filmmaker and an author and all these other things that have been possible because I get sober. Sure. I wanted to ask you about your follow-up book. Um, that's that, Colin. Yeah, uh, it, that's that was the most difficult book uh, for me to write. That's the book that really healed me because... Mm. 
orangutan I had written and it was like, you know, I, I'm just sort of throwing it up. It's like, here I am sort of, it was like, I'm grabbing the ring. I'm like, okay, I got to live. So let me try and write. And I started writing about my time in New York after that book came out and got a, a lot of great press. My agent uh, said to me, you must write a book about your childhood. And I didn't want to mm -hmm. write a book about my childhood. I was still trying to run away from it. I didn't sure. realize I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Subconsciously, I just didn't want to go there. You have to be careful too within, I think, your religion and your parents and siblings and family who are still alive and how much you put that out there. I mean, you could smear and blacken certain people in the family and it was Thanksgiving whole, might not be so fun this year. It was a process. Uh, you know, those were all very... Up in Northern Ireland, first of all, uh, so much secrecy in that community and society to actually open a door and say, hey, here's what really happened in my home and in my community. That's right. It was very, very tricky. And it was a lot for me to overcome because it was also the first time I was really understanding. So, so oh my God, I grew up during a war and I lost friends and I've been traumatized. I'd sort of admit right. that out loud. And then I had to go to the family before the books, book was published and say, this is what's going to be in the book. And I need you guys to sort of know that before it comes out. So it doesn't, you're not like blindsided. And, uh, and it was difficult. It was a difficult process. You know, at the, the moment that book was published, I had, uh, there was a full page article in the uh, Sunday world in Northern Ireland. And it was under the title. The truth is it's a bunch of lies. And they had local people saying, you know, he's making this up. There was no trouble around here. <laughs> wow. That was the next question I was going to ask you about the blowback and how much fallout did you experience? And quite a bit talking quite about that. Quite a bit at the beginning. Uh, it was hard for the family. It was hard for uh, the community. And uh, people, you know, we were, you know, coming out of Northern Ireland, which was so much of the society at the time was based on secrecy and protecting and, uh, and to sort of come out with a memoir was sort of to betray the community, to betray the silence, the code of yes. silence. Here we go now, the betrayal. I knew that was going to, I didn't want to say it, but yeah, that word is, is totally. associated um, with filth and backstabber. And yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I didn't, I, it's not like I have any information in the book that would, you know, get anybody jailed or in trouble uh, that way. But I did come out and tell a very honest, raw version of what it was like growing up. And what's happened yeah. over time is it has helped the conversation and it has helped other people be more honest and it has been very healing in many ways. The book is actually, I think, sells better now than it did when it first came out. Uh, and it's still, you know, it's still doing its thing. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it and uh, and I can sleep at night. We're proud, we're proud <laughs> and, of you and my family, And my family are proud of it. My family are proud of it. And the, you transitioned into screenwriting then. Um, I think your first work, and you can correct me, I could be wrong, uh, it was Emerald City. Uh, and I, I made a short movie called Smile. Okay. Which is on YouTube. Okay. And it's about a 10 minute movie. And it was a very, uh, I didn't know anything about filmmaking. So I started making a short movie. And that sort of was my introduction into into filmmaking. And it was a, that's a very personal sort of, uh, it's a movie about transformation. It's a poet, basically a personal poetry, a poem of a transformation. And then uh, when I saw that I could do it, I figured I can make a feature. If I can do this for 10 minutes, I can do a feature movie, which was, you know, terribly arrogant. <laughs> but you wound up doing it, right? At Emerald City. And, and that was with the first time you worked with John. Well, John and I had worked on uh, John was in my play Father Who after we met at the Irish uh, Consul uh, Consulate I had a play that performed uh, which was called Father Who 
Uh, we did it at Theater 80 down, downtown. It was a great success, and we had a lot of fun. Then he was in another play I wrote called Spud Munchers, which we uh, had a run in uh, Woodlawn with that play, also a lot of fun. And then I figured we better do a movie, and then we did Emerald City uh, together, and that was the first feature movie. And, and you were talking about, you know, John, you know, not actually wanting to punch actors. I was the guy, the director, <laughs> who was at most at risk of getting punched. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I know now you're working on or you, you released uh, and, and there's big news, too, about it getting a global distribution deal. But the movie A Bend in the River um, and it's. It's gotten such media attention. John, what's that like to see the, the movie start to really take off? It's it, it's great to see it uh, do anything after the year that we've had with uh, COVID, you know. Um, I, sure. I, I always find with Colin that no matter what we do, whether it's a play or a movie, there's always obstacles that he seems to find a way to overcome. And then there's always unforeseen obstacles that we all have to we sit by their time and finally overcome you know we all come together and i think that now that the fact that i, I think i'm like a horse at the beginning of a race and i'm just waiting for the starting gates to open because <laughs> it's been getting little glimpses and people mm -hmm. the feedback we're getting is very similar to like the feedback that we got from emerald city it's like wow this is not what we were expecting it's like people be shocked. They, I don't know. They, they go on with not so much expectations of it all, and then they're completely blowing away, blown away. And I think that's got to do with uh, Colin's writing and his journey. And that's one of the things that I find so attractive about and how I think me and Colin effortlessly kind of came into being good friends is that his journey. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I'm nothing like. Uh, uh, orangutan but in my own journey with the fighting and the training and the and leaving home and, and the immigrant experience and then having and I love that stat too because reading that reminded me of looking back and little things I did as a kid and I'm like wow yeah this is right wow he, he's gone through the same experiences that we're kind of going and then as I say Emerald City was a blast but they returned back home and live in Tyrone for five weeks, shooting a bend in a river, which is basically about a guy coming home, finding home. And I think back when we were making that, I realized that, oh my God, this isn't my home anymore. Hmm. I live somewhere else. Wow. You know, and and because and, 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 you have all these ideas in your head of, has home changed? No, are people look at you differently? You know, or uh, uh, you change, you change a, a, a lot as well. And you don't sort of realize it until you go back, but you're always kind of putting it on everything else changing. And, and in reality, it hasn't changed that much. They're still in the same schedule. They're living the same thing. Your life's just a little different from theirs, you know. And uh, I don't, the, the journey uh, for me, it's just all of a sudden becoming more aware of certain things in my life, whereas I, I wouldn't have been... Uh, uh, open to be aware too because when I was boxing it, it's a very the blinkers are on the goal the prize is that that's the prize and you, I, I simplified my life so much as that when I got the call they fight people used to say they're like Gronya, where's John and she's like oh he's in training what do you mean so where is he well so at the beginning I would have been in the apartment just sure is he not going to come not he's happy enough reading books watching TV and then I'd have been away in training camp and then after the fight, you'd have seen me for a few weeks. And then I got a call again, boom, and I was away again, you know. So uh, it, it, being able to look back on that and sort of take a wider view of actually what I was doing and what I was experiencing, I kind of used to always block all that stuff out. And I was never aware of me doing that until getting into acting, where all of a sudden there's this world of uh, being aware and feeling and, and not being afraid to show your emotions and stuff. And uh and then they meet someone like Colin, whose honesty is like, they always say where people wear their heart in their sleeve. Colin's heart is, is him as a whole. And, and, and they talk about the, the bruises and the cuts and the scrapes and, and the ugly side that 
I think we all have in common. We all have that little side of us that isn't nice that if you were to meet them, you'd be like, I wouldn't like that guy. But sometimes you fall into that kind of person. But when you start becoming more aware of it, you start realizing that, yeah, you know what? You're not alone. We're all in this little struggle to, to get through. And, and, and then they find someone else, which is a creator, and to be a part of that. I, for me personally, they, they, they go from a profession where my job was to take people apart destruction, destroy, and move forward, mm -hmm. they all of a sudden now they, to be somewhere where it's like everything's open, the smells, the sights, the sounds, and you can take people along with you on that journey. And at the end of it, you can sit in the cinema and hear their reaction. And hopefully it's an applause because that's just as terrifying as when you're walking in the Madison Square Garden. <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, and John is was playing a, a young version of you in the movie, correct? Isn't the movie slight loosely <clears throat> based on, on your experience as well? So he's actually playing a, a version of me. It's very, it, it is very autobiographical, but I, I've tried to sort of make it, you know, it's about an Irish writer who's returning home to Northern Ireland uh, after not being there for 26 years. Uh, so he's returning for the first time to sort of, face the ghosts of his past he has writer's block basically and his agent said says you know you you got to go home and and what you know what are you running from so he arrives in ireland at the beginning and it's sort of like he has to sort of come to terms uh with the ghosts of his past and who he is and uh what his place in that community is and and maybe you know it it it, it brings up all it probably presents all these issues more than it answers all the questions it's uh it's a meditation on exile on immigration on returning home on what home is i like to think of it as a sort of uh poem of uh of returning uh and, and you know b because we're from northern ireland the message is actually very universal it's about immigration anywhere really the feelings are the same it's universal whether it's australia or mexico or ireland uh you're returning home after 26 years and you deal with uh you know the same the same issues so the the movie sort of deals with all of that Okay, we're going to take a quick break for a commercial. And when we get back, I kind of want to talk to John about the burden of, of playing a, a young you, uh, how that felt, if he felt any particular responsibility. <laughs> that's, that's what I was going to say when we come back. Uh, give us one second, uh, everybody out there in the studio audience worldwide. Uh, we will be right back. John O'Connell from CW Applied Technology here. And today I want to give you a, a quick introduction to operating our Move XL Room Ultraviolet Sterilizer to show you how easy it is to use. So first, uncoil the cable and plug into a standard wall socket. Then unlock the cover case, revealing the sterilizer. Place the sterilizer on top of the cover and clamp into place. And now to set the runtime. The figures shown in red on the display are locked into the machine. The figures in yellow are what you can adjust with the buttons underneath to the runtime you want to set. Set your desired runtime, 15 minutes in this case, switch off the power and switch back on. The time you set on the yellow digits is now locked into the machine and shown in red. Now, leave the room. The bulbs will turn on in two minutes. 
One of the features of the Move XL is if someone comes into the room while the sterilizer is working, the motion sensors on the machine will pick up on that and switch off the bulbs. An alarm will also sound as it will at the end of a normal run, even without interruption. Once the Move XL has completed its run and it's to be moved to the next room, just switch off the power, wind up the cable and wheel it to the next room. It's very easy, user-friendly operation and proven technology against virus and bacteria. Hey, Chef Howder here. Want to tell you about my Amazon best-selling memoir cookbook, A Chef is Born, chock full of recipes. Also ranked the 77th book of all time out of 99, according to the Book Authority. It's a good book by the better chef than you. Well, Tony, uh, I hope those guys enjoyed seeing the Cliffs of Mohair. Uh, that particular Irish company um, is a great advertiser and sponsor of ours. So uh, really, really happy to always see them on. They have two different commercials that are running uh, out of Ireland and John O'Connell at CW Applied Technology. Uh, Tony, going back to you with Colin and John and John W. Hartman, criminal attorney. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering for John, what you know, did you feel any particular responsibility to get that character right, knowing it, you know, it somewhat was a version of of Colin? Yeah, of course. Um, I think Colin and I were basically joined at the hip through all the filming. I mean, it was a fantastic experience, and you know, I I I, did, I wouldn't want to. Go, I wouldn't be saying like I'm walking I think if I was thinking oh my god I'm playing home I would probably have intimidated myself a lot much but what, what I took from it was that the, there was a lot of experiences with returning back home that I'm like going I've been here before myself you know I'm like wow you know and then you can add in the ingredients of the story along with it then just they, they take it on further but as I say every it was like I was walking with the shadow with me through every through every door, even meeting people that were there in Tyrone who were so helpful and so thankful. I mean, the Kelly's Hotel, uh, you know, the, the, they just seemed to open their arms to us. And, uh, and we're like, you know, all, at the phone, it was like, oh, here come the Yanks. The Yanks are making a movie, you know, mm -hmm. two, two local guys. And, and even though I was from Derry City, which isn't that far up the road, when you grew up at home, there would be like a, oh, Tyrone Derry. When I came, there was none. It was like, no, he's one of ours, you know. Oh, he's, he's there helping Broderick put a movie together. Whatever they need, that's give him a hand, you know. So uh, I hope I did a good job. I felt really comfortable in, in, in what we were doing. Like Colin was, was kind enough to his uh, family. We got a house, a little cottage up off Alton Muskin Road. And there was no TV. There was there was an, a, an open fire. And there was a, a, a cooker where I could put on my, my cup of tea. So at night, me and Johnny McConnell, who plays the priest, who's, who plays my older brawler in the movie, uh, Colin used to drop us back there at night, and we'd have the fire blazing, the teapot on, and we'd be, or I'd be footing with a guitar, or we'd be going over our scenes for the next day, and just having that sort of aloneness together in, 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 in the middle of Ireland. You know, like he'd open the door, and it was pitch black, so it was all you could have was the, the stars at night, and the moon shining like was, was your light way. It was just gorgeous. And even the, the smell of the manure in the next fields and stuff like that, that they hear the sheep ban and stuff. It was, there was just something very, I, I just wanted to absorb it all. And then just, as I say, let it hopefully come out through and uh, on the screen. John, I, got, I have a question for you. Um, generally with acting, what do you prefer? You prefer the theater or do you prefer doing movies? I just prefer working. So whether it's on a stage or whether it's in front of a camera, um, 
I have had some great experiences. One of, how I got into acting actually was with a, a friend of Tony, a mutual friend of ours, Seamus McDonough, and Colin knows Seamus as well. And when I retired back in two thousand and one or two thousand eleven, sorry, Seamus. Uh, now uh, wait a minute. We didn't know you knew Seamus. No, oh. no, Seamus talked about him during the podcast. Seamus oh. talked about me on his interview. Yes, because <laughs> I watched that as well. He did. Uh, he mentioned him. And uh, Seamus was the one that reached out to me because he was acting before as well, and I was always interested in it. But you no, know, when you look back on and you read about certain fighters and people in their careers, whenever it went wrong, is whenever they got distracted and started thinking on something else. So I was adamant to see how far the boxing I could go with, and then maybe I'll get I'll get to that later. And so once I retired, Seamus called me to make sure that I was okay because there was all these rumors too that maybe I had a brain injury or something like that, which is still oh, out there to question, you know. Um, but uh, I said to Seamus, "No, everything's great." He says, "Well, I'm doing a play. Are you still interested in acting?" And I'm like, "I, I would love it." And he goes, "Well, we're doing this show. It's it's about a, an Irish American." He's a, a fighter. He's considering retirement and he's an alcoholic. And I was like, where do you sign up? Just yeah. let's do it. And that really sort of broke me on to the whole idea of getting on a stage. And then within that time, I met Colin as well. And like the first show I did with Colin was Spud Munchers, which I think today, if it was the same circumstances, I wouldn't have the gall to actually try and get on a stage. Because we only had like a three-week rehearsal, if even. Colin, wow. do you remember whenever we went on, and it wasn't the last show that we actually got the show correct? Spud, Spud Muncher is hilarious. But it was so much fun, and <laughs> everyone that came to see it, I, that's what I loved about it. I was like, the fact that it was just so much fun to go out there and take these people on a little journey for, well, it was an hour or an hour. I, I think it was an hour the first time we went out. It was about an hour and 20 minutes when we finally got the show right between forgetting lines and things like that, you know, but People just to be out there. Out and, doors that they weren't supposed to go out. <laughs> <laughs> but just to be, to oh. be out there, we, we know sifting it and, and, and taking these people. And then once you get the people, once you know you have them and they're on that journey with you, like there, there's, there's, a, there's a very similar feel that you have that whenever you're in a ring fighting and you're aware of that, you know, when you've got that audience behind you, you know, when you've got the, you've got the guy in the back footing, it's the, the there's the same conflict on a stage, you know, and uh, that, that I don't know that that that's very exciting and very beautiful. But as as they say, as you get older, if I know if I know and then what I know now, I wouldn't have had the the courage to get on to do it, you know. But uh, I think if well, if Colin asked me to do anything, I think I would probably say yes, no problem, you know. <laughs> well, like, anything Colin does would be really hard to say right, no my to. Wife, Stop oh, it. the wife is there. Hey, nice for on you. Wait a minute. Bring the wife on. <laughs> they says bring the wife on. The uh oh alarm went off. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi. John Hi. speaks John speaks so much about you and so well of you. Ah, oh, I I pay him his fifty dollars later for that. <laughs> Granya is also in the movie, by the way. She was in Emerald City and in uh, Abandon the River. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. oh, I guess it, family affair. She was also she was also in my play, Father Who, which we really loved. <laughs> well, I mean, anything Colin does, I didn't see the play, obviously, but, uh, you know, I've read the book um, and I want to see the movie. I've seen clips of the movie, but I want to see it in its entirety. Uh, but anything you seem to be connected to, Colin, really turns out well. You have a very good creative sense uh, and filmmaking seems to be your niche. Thank you. Tony, uh, just just on, on you know on a note, I know a lot of people are curious when they can see the movie and how they can see the movie. Uh, we've had a lot of setbacks because of COVID. Uh, you know, we had sold out the Belfast uh, premiere uh, twice, and then they called it oh, off. That no. was at the beginning of COVID. And, you know, here we are now, basically, we were coming out and we were planning a big New York City premiere. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll announce it here. We've, we've just in the last week decided that that's not going to happen. 
and uh, we are actually going to the movie is screening in Chicago at the end of September. That'll be its big screen debut in in America, and uh, then we're going to have a. Uh, release online it'll be vod which is what all movies are now there really aren't any movie premieres happening in the united states because it seems like an irresponsible sort of thing to do at the moment and uh, so it'll be a vod but hopefully by the end of september uh we probably will probably announce a date within the next uh week or two but by but, but by the end of september the movie should be available to watch in the united states in ireland england uk uh, wherever uh, online article and i don't know uh davis you can tell me if if that's what's still happening but it, it seemed as if uh you were getting a worldwide distribution deal we have we, yes we, we do have that still yes. and uh, and the movie just screened at the uh can uh market over there and got some great buzz uh just a couple of weeks ago so as i say we we are just gathering all the information and we'll have information on uh the release date uh we 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 have to talk to the distributor about what date they decide to actually let the movie go so hopefully by the end of september and where can people go to get information about the movie you should just go to uh, my website. Uh, as soon as I have the information, I'll post it on there, www.colinbroderick.com. And, uh, you know, you'll have information there about any, the, the movie about Emerald City and about upcoming projects and books that I have. That's wonderful. I hope you guys will come back when the, you know, a little bit further down the road when the movie's uh already up and kicking once we get a chance to watch it because i know i'll have questions once i see it wonderful looking forward to, i'm really excited for people to see it i'm really really proud of the movie that we've done it's not like any other movie that i've seen and uh it's it's really profound and special what john has brought uh to the movie this is his first role as a leading man in a movie and he is you know, every bit as worthy as uh, Liam Neeson or Colin Farrell or, uh, you know, any, any of our, any of our Irish leading men. And I, and I would argue a more handsome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I believe it because John is a, is a phenomenal actor. Uh, he, and he brings 150% to anything he does. Uh, he, I mean, it's, it's really amazing to watch him. He's got such focus. Uh, he wants to get it right. He works at getting it perfect. Uh, so I, I can't wait to see it. I imagine it's going to be an enjoyable ride. He's amazing in this movie. He really is amazing. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Uh, fortunately, we're out of time now, but I do hope that both of you will come back again. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It was an honor. Give us, to Thank be you. Able to go. Give Thank us an update when you guys come back. Thank you. Maybe we can run a little authorized clip or something. Absolutely. Oh, that'd be nice, a trailer or anything. Absolutely make that happen. There is a trailer online. Uh, if you just Google, uh, go on YouTube and look for uh, a Bend in the River movie trailer. There's a teaser trailer online at the moment, so that's available. You could link that to this interview if you like. Sure, I think that's what I watched, actually. Oh, okay, it, cool. And it, it, it generates quite a buzz. I mean, just, just watching it, I could see the quality of it. So I am looking forward to it. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time. It was an honor to talk to both of you. John, it's always great to see you. Great to see you too, Tony. Thank, and you. thank you so much for the invite and, and a pleasure to meet you too, man. Thank you so much. And as I say, I've, I watched your, your last uh, few podcasts and I really love the so Seamus good. McDonough one as well. I mean, yeah. uh, I just love Seamus as a human being. He's, He's a great so, guy. Like Not Colin, good. open and honest, you know, and, and they'd be someone that came from the same background as mine where you used to hurt people for a living. You see him so open and smiling and happy and just spreading joy, you know. I couldn't agree with you more, John. I, I love Seamus. Yeah. One of my he favorite loves, people. Irish guests are the best. <laughs>
<laughs> is that what it is? It's it just is. that's what it is. I'm glad I'm part Irish. <laughs> Although he did say he had the worst Irish accent he ever heard. <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> well, it's next time, so when I seen that, by the way, the next time you're going to have to get a a, a lot better hair designers because Seamus was terribly worried about his hair. Oh my I'm, gosh! I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not wrong. <laughs> He was so funny in that episode. He is hilarious. He's such a great guy. <laughs> Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you, guys. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, John. Have a great week.